This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 947, recorded on October 19th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, I am in Washington, D.C. at ID Week, and today I went to a session on monkeypox, and a representative from CDC said they no longer recommend using a needle to unroof lesions because there are too many accidents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think we know, uh, yeah, we, we know why. <laughs> yes. And before we hand it over to you, let me remind everyone that if you would like to support our work here at Microbe TV and wear a t-shirt with a spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 on it, please go over to vaccinated.us, pick out one of their cool spike t-shirts, and when you go to check out Use the promo code Microbe TV, and they will uh, donate their profits to our science communication work. Thanks very much to Matt at Vaccinated.us. Okay, Daniel. All right. I will start with uh, my quotation. For I found myself embarrassed with so many doubts and errors that it seemed to me that the effort to instruct myself had no effect other than the increasing discovery of my own ignorance. Um, and that's Rene Descartes. Um, and uh, this is this is ID week when uh, a lot of people gather together and we we move forward and we realize uh, uh, how many things we've been doing wrong, how many things we we can do better. <laughs> and uh, it's a great, great time for us to, well, I think uh, be be humble <laughs> and uh, and learn. Um, all right, well, let's get right into it. So first, uh, Polio, keep reminding everyone, get your polio vaccines. Don't check your serology. I'm still getting questions about that. Can I just check my serologies? No. If you haven't gotten, a, if you haven't gotten your polio vaccine, get your polio vaccine. And all right, influenza, as I promised, let me start with the article, Prediction of Upcoming Global Infection Burden of Influenza Seasons After Relaxation of Public Health and Social Measures during the COVID-19 pandemic, a modeling study. Uh, this was published in The Lancet Global Health. Um, we are getting better at predicting the weather. <laughs> Perhaps we are getting um, a bit better at predicting the impact of upcoming influenza season. So uh, lots of ways of predicting the upcoming um, flu season. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of history here. Uh, I know people are, Dr. Griffin, why are you so, you know, doom and gloom about the upcoming uh, winter? Well, as a, a bit of interesting history, uh, the CDC's attempts to forecast the upcoming flu season began, um, I'm going to say, in 2013 with the Predict the Influenza Season Challenge. Um, this was a competition that encouraged outside academic and private industry researchers to forecast the 2013-14 flu season. Um, each flu, flu season um, after the CDC's influenza division collaborated with external researchers on flu forecasting, um, the CDC has provided forecasting teams data, relevant public health forecasting targets, um, and forecast accuracy metrics, while teams submit their forecasts, which are based on a variety of methods and data sources each week. And I'm going to leave a link in our show notes for that. Um, the original competition was a competition with a cash prize. And I'm going to read from the 2013 announcement. Um, the registrant who most successfully predicts the timing peak and intensity of the 2013-2014 flu season using social media data, and they actually mentioned Twitter, internet search, um, web surveys will receive an award of $75,000 and CDC recognition. So I thought that was interesting. But this modeling study um, that I'm going to um, leave a link to in the Lancet Global Health um, is introducing new variables from the COVID-19. COVID-19 with waning immunity secondary to the lack of influenza recently, as well as the dropping of much of the public health and social mitigation measures, um, these non-pharmaceutical interventions that we've been discussed, 
And this study, along with what we saw in the Southern Hemisphere, um, is predictive of a significant influenza season. Um, and I, I will say, we are already seeing this, our urgent cares, our hospitals, um, the CDC flu tracking, um, we're already seeing an exponential rise in flu cases. So the season is already here, so what to do? Um, if you are higher risk, or holding an event or organizing a gathering with high-risk people in attendance, remember all we learned from COVID-19. Ventilation, outdoors is better than indoors, hygiene, vaccination, and early treatment. And I'll add that getting that flu jab isn't just about you. Hey, Daniel, did anyone win that prize? You know, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be interesting. We should bring them on, right? <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling no one did. <laughs> All right. Monkeypox. The, the monkeypox is not a gay disease or an African disease. It is an infectious disease. Um, numbers are still trending down. Um, I think they'll keep trending down, particularly if people are not poking themselves with needles as they unroof those lesions. Um, but it was, uh, it was, I was sort of patting myself on the back the other day, talking with one of my patients who is a member of the high-risk community. Um, he's like, Dr. Griffin, Summer's over. What did you expect? And it, it is sort of funny. You know, we talked about how the behavior got better. Well, you know, summer, the, the days of summer love are over. So we will see what happens um, going forward. Uh, but for now, um, remember, if you don't test for it, you will not diagnose it. Uh, and you can do that with the swabs. Uh, you don't have to do that with a sharp needle. Um, and when we do see cases, remember, stomp T-pox, um, the trial to understand the role of tecoviramat in this disease. All right, COVID, right to it nice and quickly. Um, just the, the first I will throw out here, this is sort of a, a, a news item maybe, the Biden administration announced that the COVID-19 public health emergency will continue through January 11th, 2023. Um, so the public health emergency first declared in January 2020 and renewed every 90 days since. Uh, the declaration, it's, it's actually important. It enabled the emergency authorization of COVID vaccines, testing, um, treatments for free. It expanded um, Medicaid coverage to millions of people, many of whom um, will lose, um, lose this coverage once the emergency ends. Um, it temporarily opened up telehealth access for Medicare recipients. Um, we do hear we're going to get 60 days notice before the public health emergency um, might end. Um, but I have to say a lot of these measures, I'm particularly going to harp on the telehealth access, um, has been tremendous. And really a lot of data um, suggesting that um, this is a very effective way of reaching a lot of individuals. You know, they, you leave the hospital, um, you've been seen by the doctor every day, and suddenly you're out there in the world and you're told you just went from being sick enough to be in a hospital. I'd like to have you come see me next week in the in the office. A lot of them can't make it, um, but the ability to check in with them in the home, make sure they're doing okay, run through the medicines, make sure that transition to the outpatient setting went well. Um, these are tremendous things. So hopefully we can um, maintain a lot of this going forward. All right, children, COVID and other vulnerable populations, children are at risk from COVID. Um, so when I was on the local Channel 12 news station with Elizabeth Hashin, um, I, guess, I shouldn't say local anymore. It's not like seven areas. It's like the, the whole tri-state area. Um, but I was asked about the MMWR adverse childhood experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic and associations with poor mental health and suicidal behaviors among high school students, adolescent behaviors and experience survey, United States, January through June, 2021. Um, really disturbing. Um, none of this is surprising. Um, perhaps people remember um, when I, uh, I questioned some approaches to the pandemic and our priorities. Um, when at risk to my Irish ancestry, I, I suggested things like perhaps we should close the bars and open the schools rather than the other way around. Um, as the authors point out, um, social and educational disruptions during the COVID-19 pandemic have significantly, I put that in, exacerbated concerns about adolescents' mental health and suicidal behavior. Um, looking at the data from this survey, um, really, you know, not surprising, but shocking at the, the level, 37% of the U.S. high school students reported poor mental health, okay? 20% considering and 9% attempting suicide in the preceding year. So really devastating. Um, so 
hopefully we learned something there. All right, the pre-exposure period, transmission testing, um, I keep reinforcing, this is when you come up with a plan. You don't wait until you test positive. You wanna have a plan ahead of time. All right, COVID active vaccination. Um, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Vaccinated people still get infected. They are just, li just less likely to die or have severe disease. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit here about the whole nasal vaccine discussion. I, I wanna put this whole nasal vaccine discussion in context. I, I don't know, Vincent, how much you've followed this, but lots of superlative, scary ideas about how US biosecurity is on the line if we are not the first to develop a nasal vaccine that stops transmission. Um, we, we <laughs> Vincent's shaking his head for those of you that, that don't know. We hear that India, Russia, and Iran have authorized nasal vaccines. Um, I would be delighted if more money goes into research, um, you know, and if a chunk is given to scientists investigating nasal vaccines that stop transmission. Um, but a couple reality checks here for people that are seeing this in social media. Um, people who get that Hobbesian natural infection with SARS-CoV-2, who get COVID-19 acquired through the nasal and respiratory route, guess what? They get reinfected. We see reinfections in some cases as early as one month after. So understanding mucosal immunity is still in its infancy. And yes, it needs more funding. Um, but let's not miss, mix our apples with oranges here. People are calling um, for nasal administered vaccines that can, are going to produce such a robust muco mucosal immunity that they block transmission. The nasally administered vaccines licensed in India Russia and Iran are just systemic immunity inducing vaccines given by a spray instead of a needle. Did flu mist turn out to be a game changer for influenza vaccines? Um, did the world end when one company invented flu mist? Um, you know, when vaccines are, are introduced, when vaccines get better, uh, no country is gonna hide the science and let the rest of the world suffer. So I think there's a lot of superlatives here. Um, I, I don't feel like the end is near and, and our national biosecurity is on the line. Um, and do ask that important question. Is it a nasal administered vaccine or is it a nasal transmission blocking mucosal immunity inducing vaccine? A few thoughts, Daniel. Uh, the problem here is that even if you had a nasal vaccine that worked really well to induce, say, antibodies that block infection, those high levels would decline within a few months, and you would get infected, and you would transmit again. A good example is the polio vaccine, the oral polio vaccine, which is used to stop outbreaks because it stops transmission for a few months after it's administered. But beyond that, antibody levels decline. You can get infected in the gut. And until the memory response kicks in, you're able to transmit. That's basic immunology. And no vaccine is going to be able to get around that, folks. Now, maybe if you could block transmission for a couple of months, let's say, Daniel, we could immunize everybody in the U.S. at the same time. Then you could stop transmission. But what's the likelihood of that happening? Yeah, I, th I think this is a pretty high bar that people are are asking for. It, it is a new frontier of science, um, you know, and we will move forward. But yeah, I just think a lot of superlatives here. Let's let's sort of bring bring things back down to earth. All right, the article: severe COVID nineteen outcomes after full vaccination of primary schedule and initial boosters. Pooled analysis of national prospective cohort studies of 30 million individuals in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales was published in The Lancet. I'm going to put my glasses on because I have some figures we're going to walk everyone through. Um, if people can actually, if they the chance to go through this article while we talk, I think this is worth it. There are some really important um, bits of data here um, or datum that have been compiled so that we have the data. Uh, between December 8th, 2020 and February 28th, 2022, 16,208,600 individuals completed their primary, primary vaccine schedule and 13,836,390 individuals received a booster dose. Um, between this period of time, um, 
0.4% of the primary vaccine group, 0.2% of those who received their booster had severe COVID-19 outcomes. Um, the risk of severe COVID-19 outcomes was reduced after receiving the booster. Um, the rate changed 8.8 events per thousand to 7.6 events per thousand person years. So a little bit of a difference there. But let's put this in context. This is a reduction of 1.2 events per thousand person years. So a number needed to treat or vaccinate of about a thousand. Um, older adults, um, those that are elderly, elderly, even particularly more so greater than or equal to 80 versus those in the 18 to 49, um, adjusted relative risk of 3.6. Those with comorbidity, so greater or equal to five versus none, uh, 9.5 adjusted relative risk. Being male, 1.23, a little bit worse. Um, and those with certain underlying health conditions, in particular individuals receiving immunosuppressants, um, increased risk 5.8. Those with chronic kidney disease, so I'd like to point that out, 3.7. Um, all remained at high risk despite that initial booster. So um, I'm going to recommend that people actually look at the, uh, there's a really nice figure, and it really kind of gets at, you know, who we're talking about, who we're targeting when we when we encourage boosters. And we do, we do encourage boosters in certain contexts. Um, and there's this wonderful figure one. Uh, I'm assuming um, Vincent's had a chance to sort of glance at it, but a couple things that stand out. Um, one, I thought it was really interesting when you just sort of look at everything together, this greater than or equal to 20 weeks after a second dose, we start to see um, an adjusted um, rate ratio increase. Um, age is a big factor in looking who, at who's at risk. Um, move through ethnicities, um, number of risk groups, so the number of comorbidities, the more certainly starts to add up. Um, and then um, the number of previous PCR tests. Not sure what to make of that. But I think there's really a lot in here. And it really, really sort of asks this question, boy, if I'm elderly, elderly, as um, Paul Offit has said, getting that booster, um, whether it's the bivalent or whether we had stuck with the old, um, you really start to see a lot of bang for your buck. I know, Vincent, if you had any comments on this complicated. So this is from the when vaccination started and through February 2022. So uh, we had, um, we don't have Omicron at that point, correct? Or we do? So Omicron, I'm thinking about timing of when Omicron came in. Uh, Maybe that's the earliest uh, yeah. dates for Omicron. So, so this is m mainly pre-Omicron. Yeah, main, then, it is mainly, yeah, I'll definitely say that. And so I, I still think it's interesting to look at the effect, as you said, of, of age and, and other conditions when it's all together on the same graph, because Often you read a paper and you get bits here and there. It's hard to compile them, but this does that in a very nice way. So I like this. Yep. All right. Um, Ev Usheld, we keep plugging Ev Usheld. Um, I will tell people there's a really nice article hot off the press. So we'll be talking about Ev Usheld a little bit more um, next week. I continue to bemoan its lack of use, um, but let's move right into the COVID early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase, the time of viral replication, um, and sort of went through trying to put a lot of the data together. I have this vision that people will be sitting there at ID week on Saturday morning, drinking their coffee, uh, listening to the clinical update, taking notes. Um, you know, the big thing, number one, what is the number one recommended treatment? Forget about what you see in social media. Forget about rebound. Um, Pax Lovid. Um, if you are a high risk individual during that first three to five days, um, we have a number of excellent studies, 89 to 88% reduction in the EPIC HR study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, unvaccinated. We have the high risk patient progression to hospitalization or death from Clallet Health Services in Israel, showing a 73 to 79% um, reduction in those endpoints in mostly immune individuals. Um, and we have reduction in progression to hospitalization or death um, in the EPIC research. So we have a growing growing data, growing experience that this really prevents progression. Um, and as we talked about, the COVID rebound that week two 
Um, we've been calling this the early inflammatory phase or the cytokine storm phase for over two years now. Um, and now we have very good data that yes, this represents an immune response and not a second period of viral replication that would benefit from additional antivirals. Um, it's not that easy to get someone on Paxlovid. I know they sort of have this idea that um, folks are just going to show up at the pharmacy and, you know, this test and treat in the same place. But there are a number of drug-drug interactions. Um, I was on a call today with our urgent care um, providers throughout the tri-state area. Um, and most of us will sit down um, and we'll leave links to this. We'll go to the COVID-19 drug interaction checker um, and we'll run through the medicines with the individual. Um, we also need to look at kidney function. So this is why we went to medical school so that we can go ahead, we can work ourselves through these challenges, but we can make a difference. Number two, uh, I do bemoan the limited access um, to what is an incredibly effective drug if used at the right time, and that's remdesivir used in the first seven days. And this is a three-day early IV approach. 87% reduction in progression if given in the first five to seven days. That's our New England Journal of Medicine study. Um, early remdesivir in solid organ transplant patients, 88% re reduction in progressing to hospitalization. Um, and then we've also talked about an 84% reduction in high-risk folks um, three-day course during the Omicron um, season. So um, really tremendous data on remdesivir. Um, and number three, and this is an inferior because we do have some head-to-head -head comparison, bebtilovimab. Um, this is for adult and pediatric patients down to 12 years of age. Um, we have limited efficacy data here. We're sort of hoping we carry over from the prior monoclonals, um, but we do have that retrospective cohort study of greater than 3,600 patients that we've talked about where the bebtilovimab 1.4% progressed versus one2 in Paxlovid, 0.2% died in the bebtilovimab, zero deaths in Paxlovid. So I know which group I would like to be in. Um, and malnupiravir last and least with only that 30% reduction in progression. So less impressive, um, but again, no renal, no drug issues, um, but um, be careful if you're used in an individual of childbearing age, you could potentially could get pregnant, um, get that negative pregnancy test, not authorized for those under 18. Um, and uh, hopefully, sort of important here, avoid doing harm. Um, avoid those steroids. Um, overall progression of severe disease and hospitalization in one study increased six-fold. Mortality increased 35%. Um, another study showing um, hospital admission, adjusted odds ratio 2.5, um, elevated cardiac risk, elevated risk of pulmonary embolism, and elevated adjusted odds of mortality of 3.5. Um, so you are, you are not just doing something innocuous. You are doing something harmful if you give steroids in that first week and avoid those antibiotics. Multiple studies looking at doxycycline, multiple studies looking at azithromycin, no meaningful effect on the clinical course, and you are feeding into the antimicrobial resistance. Um, yesterday, I was in the ER. I was consulting on, a, on an older woman um, who was admitted and her daughter was there um, and I was getting the story. And so the story was the, this um, woman was diagnosed, came down with acute COVID-19. Uh, the primary care doc um, suggested that they start um, the woman on Paxlovid. The daughter was not comfortable with that. She had heard all this stuff about Paxlovid. Um, she had a long discussion. Um, finally, she was able to get the doctor to give her mother steroids and a Z pack, and now her mother is in the ho in the hospital on day twelve of illness on oxygen. So um, yeah, um, yeah. Not a TWIV listener, I guess. Uh, not a not a TWIV listener. I hope not a TWIV listener. Um, hopefully, one that will become a TWIV listener, and then this will not happen again. All right. Um, COVID, the early inflammatory, lower respiratory hypoxic phase, as I just described, a woman who progressed to that, um, coincident with following administration of steroids and antibiotics during that first week instead of um, something that would have reduced that risk by 90%, something that increases that, perhaps sixfold. Um, now is the time when 
this um, hypoxic woman um, might end up with steroids appropriately. This is when we talk about anticoagulation. We're probably already past the remdesivir window, past day 10, um, gonna require pulmonary support. Um, some cases we're still using immune modulators. Um, and perhaps a nice silver lining to the pandemic was suggested by the article, successful immunomodulators for treatment of COVID-19 have opened the pathway for comparative trials published in CMI. So here the authors suggest, and I'm, I'm, I'm on board with the hopeful aspect here, that the success of immune modulation in the early inflammatory phase of COVID-19, that rebound, that second week with steroids, baricitinib and tocilizumab um, may be um, uh, something that allows us to move forward and start looking at immune modulation in a lot of other situations. All right, and I will, I will wrap us up with long COVID, the late phase. I'm gonna try to keep these um, uh, under an hour, maybe even down at half an hour. That's our goal again. Um, so a link to the BMJ paper, Long COVID, an update for primary care. Really a great resource for these growing number of individuals um, who we're trying to take care of. Um, we're still waiting for more evidence um, to help us in this arena, um, but it's nice to get an understanding, the different groups, um, and a lot of the different things that are being tried out there. And I will uh, say no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, I do want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click donate. Even a small amount, every little bit helps us continue to do our work. Um, and here we are in October wrapping out our wrapping up our three-month <laughs> fundraiser for floating doctors. Uh, we'll have to throw in some wraps so that we're actually wrapping it up. Um, but we're trying to get up to that level where we can make a potential donation of $40,000. Um, so help us, help us reach that goal. Speaking of, of listening to TWIV, Daniel, I, uh, I had lunch today at the Unconventional Cafe, by the way, oh, Unconventional Diner. Outstanding. And, okay. Uh, if you ever go there, it it's right in the convention center on the outside. So I wondered if it would be any good, and it's actually quite good. Anyway, I'm sitting at the counter. There's a guy next to me, and he looks at me, and he says, you know, I never listened to TWIV, but I think I will now. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess because I was eating at that diner, he thought he should listen. But anyway, this is a shout out to Brett in case uh, Brett starts uh, listening. <laughs> listening to TWIV. He's got it now. The, the funny thing is tomorrow I'm going to record a TWIV with Jeff Taubenberger at NIH. Uh, and Brett turns out to have trained with him at NIH. You know, it's a small world. It, it is a small world. All right, uh, on to your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Jerry writes, I developed cellulitis in my right leg, not diabetic, after IV ceftriaxone was not working as fast as my physician wanted. I was put on Zyvox caplets, which resolved it quickly, and I just finished last Thursday. I've been told that in addition to the normal antibiotic side effects and MA, MAOI issues, this particular medicine can play havoc with your immune system. I'm due for my booster, and I'm in the class of people who should get it. I'm concerned, however, that my immune system is not currently up to the challenge. What would your recommendation be on timing? I'm doubly dosed with the initial vaccine. I've had two previous boosters. I've already had my flu shot in September with along with my first dose of Shingrix. I would have gotten my COVID booster at the same time, except my provider was not offering that one at that time. Thank you for your help. Now, this is a great question. So linazolid, actually one of, one of my favorites, a great um, MRSA uh, medication. Oral bioavailability is excellent. It's now generic. So um, if you, you work this right, you can actually get it affordably. Um, it usually takes a few weeks before we start to see this cumulative impact. So really at about two to three weeks is when we start seeing the, um, the marrow suppressive um, impact. So usually, and here we are at ID week, right? So people are up on the recommendations, ID society recommendations, about five days in general for that cellulitis. So five, seven, short course linazolid. Um, I don't think there's going to be much of a problem. If you waited a couple weeks just to be on the safe side, I think that's reasonable. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest you need to wait much beyond that. 
Amy writes, given the upcoming cold and flu and COVID season, I started wondering, if faced with a swab that returns positive for COVID and influenza, do I treat that patient with Paxlovid and Tamiflu at the same time? And gosh, I feel bad for their GI tract if that's the case. What treatment guidelines address this? So yes, yes, that that is the recommendation. Yes, the Paxlovid and the tummy flu pill. Um, so you know the nice thing they'll be on it for the the five days. They'll they'll get that uh, that taste, that metallic taste in their mouth. So you may recommend they try some uh, strong hard candy to help with that. Um, but yeah, we're going to see a lot of this. Actually, Australia had a lot of uh, bad experience with the twindemic as as people have started to refer to this so the the flu rona right getting you can get more than one thing at the same time and you could treat more than one thing and should at the same time james writes just listen to your latest update on covid rebound i thought i would pass this along to you i know that pfizer has been pushing for a second course and the fda is balking at this rightly so so now pfizer is putting together this trial There's also a 10-day course being sponsored by Pfizer also at the FDA request as well. Still not happy with Fauci taking a second course in spite of the current EUA, and uh, James provides a link to that clinical trial. Based on the CID paper you mentioned, not sure if this is even necessary and wouldn't even provide answers to more pertinent questions. Love Dr. Griffin quoting, quoting Ford on learning retirement. Let's have more time to learn things. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it's, we got to do the science, right? And, you know, sometimes we do the science because we want to know the answer. Sometimes we do the science because there's a vacuum there. And without addressing that vacuum, people are going to do stuff. Um, and that's what's going on. People are getting second courses of Paxlovid. I actually have heard of some fairly famous, prominent individuals that have gone ahead and done that, as mentioned. Um, so we need to know the answer. But it is interesting. We, we looked with remdesivir. 10 versus 5, and now we're down to 3 in the first week. So um, more actually was not better with remdesivir. Understanding the biology of this disease would lead me to think more is not better with the um, Paxlovid. But yes, let's let's do the science. Um, yeah, sure. Pfizer at some point is going to be selling this drug commercially. They would love to be able to sell more pills. Um, but yeah, let, let's let's lead this with the science. Chris writes, how common is severe COVID in infants up to six months of age? So fortunately, it is, it is not common. It's one of these tough things. Um, you know, children in general are quite resilient. Um, but no, um, this, unfortunately, as we saw, um, particularly last winter, that, that zero to four years, that zero to six was actually one of the highest um, impacted uh, relative. Um, but fortunately, we're talking about, um, you know, rare Um, uncommon events. And lastly, Clark writes, my spouse and I are physicians in San Francisco. For patients at increased risk for complications of flu, we wondered if there are any known significant downsides to their receiving two flu vaccinations this season and what the optimal timing of them or spacing between them might be. Profound thanks for the best COVID infectious disease information podcast on the web. Okay. Um, so again, it would be great. We, we do need the science on this. There, there are a few of us who are, who are winging it based upon our, our immunology sense. Um, you know, one of the things, and I know this has come up in the past, is when you get that influenza vaccine, um, your protection against um, symptomatic um, influenza uh, does wane over the, the few months. And it's sort of about a 10, 12% decrease per month going forward. So you start running the numbers and you say, okay, so I get my flu shot early October, and then I go November, December, January, February. It's four months out. Um, would it make sense to do a second shot? It seems like it would make sense. Um, I know there's people out there who do it, myself included, and uh, but we, we, we should do the science, um, particularly in higher risk populations, and not just look at symptomatic influenza, but also look at the risk of hospitalization, severe disease. And what's really important, I'm sort of plug here, is when people get influenza, their risks for the next 30 days of getting admitted for a cardiovascular issue, um, for having other issues, does go up. So it's important to look at the big picture in those studies as well. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.